The following is a recording of a live questions and answers session that took place on Friday, October 5th, 2012. Hello and welcome in to eBible Fellowship Questions and Answers Time, where you can interact with us with your questions and comments related to the Bible, and we'll try to respond as well as possible by going to the Bible. And so, with our Bibles at the ready, it's now time to turn things over to our speaker, Chris McCann. Good evening, Chris. Good evening, and welcome once again to our Friday night question and answer. Let let me just reiterate that everyone is welcome and invited to share whatever you would like from the Bible, if you have a question or a comment, and I'll try to respond as much as I'm able. Just please raise your hand and contact us in the ways that were just outlined, and I'll, again, try to turn to the Bible in order to find some answers or responses to your question or your comment. But now at this point, we will open up the room, and let's go to our first caller tonight. Hello. Uh, yes, good evening, Brother McCann. Uh, last night, how interesting, uh, and again tonight, how interesting the study that the Ark was in the hand of the Philistines. I was uh, thinking exactly the same thing, but my mind and my question goes to Mark chapter 14, verse 60 through 61, if you can. Sure. Mark fourteen, sixty and 61. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And what's your uh, question, or, or how are you relating this? And also verse 62, please. I'm sorry. Oh, 62. And Jesus said, I am. Um, well, let me. Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Well, my question kind of goes to a <clears throat> First Samuel chapter 5. It, is it a picture of what the high priest, chief priest, and all the council would experience or come to realize spiritually as the churches must be coming to see or manifest uh, what is taking place uh, in the plague with the plague? Do you get the sense of my question? Did I word that right? Well, yeah, when, when Christ says, you shall see the Son of Man coming, uh, the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming, in the clouds of heaven, it must be understood spiritually because um, there's no record in the Bible that, that anything like this literally happened. And, and so it has to be that from, from that point, I think it says in Matthew 26, um, in verse 64, it's a parallel verse, hereafter shall you see in in Matthew twenty six sixty four, hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And this word means from now. And so it, it is a verse that's letting us know that not literally, but spiritually God uh, demonstrated, God proved that Christ was the Messiah and that's why sitting on the right hand of power, and um, and also that he was bringing judgment upon Israel. Remember the veil, the temple being rent. What the the apostles and the disciples would begin to declare that that God was establishing churches also were indications that that Israel was under the judgment of God and. And Christ was under the restraint, uh, under the rule of Israel at this point. Is that what you're you're relating? Yeah. That the as the, the ark, ark was in possession of the Philistines, Christ was um, under the rule of the the Jewish authorities. Yes, sir. Well, That's yeah, there there probably is a relationship because it's dealing with judgment. Jesus demonstrating the judgment that he endured for the sins of his people before the foundation of the world and and the 
historical situation in 1 Samuel 5 is pointing to the judgment uh, that begins on the churches. And, and my, so there would be some relationship. And we, Okay, so that's where my question led to. Will the churches be coming to realize this as well? Well, at, I think they did throughout uh, increasingly so. Uh, I don't know how far we could carry this and to what degree. Uh, I wouldn't accuse any of them of, uh, of of lying or anything like that regarding their understanding or their knowledge if they denied it. But I think in the sense that they can see also, on a human level, the degradation of the churches. They can see the falling away, especially in the re- more Reformed congregations. Many of us have had conversations with people who stayed in the churches who who uh, told us about their feelings and 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 how they thought the church was in a sorrowful condition, and so they have some realization, and they also i think had realization that Mr. Camping was a good man and a faithful man and a godly man in family radio, they had some understanding was the ministry of God. I'm sure of that. You can't operate in the in the way that Family Radio did and, and Mr. Camping did for 50 years and those in the churches not take note of it, even though they would be his harshest critics. And now, of course, they, they call them all kinds of names and Family Radio all kinds of names. But still, uh, they had... Um, evidence shown them from the scriptures and as well as a witness of a faithful ministry um, of what God was saying in his word. Yes, and Brother McCann, uh, your wonderful work is dearly appreciated. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for those verses. And let's go to the next person. Welcome to our Friday night question and answer. Hi, Chris. How are you? Oh, good. Um, Thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, In Revelation chapter 9, concerning the uh, 200,000, they were the locusts that came out of the smoke uh, and upon the earth in verse 3. And then they were, the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And these were the 200,000 of the army of the horsemen. Now these these were upon the earth in verse 3. Could we say that the horsemen were the elect, but yet they were only those who were alive on the earth as of May 21st? Uh, no, we can't say that. It, it's true that there is similarity when we read about the locusts, and then we read about the 200 million horsemen. Uh, for instance, the locusts, it says in um, verse 10 of Revelation 9, and they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And then it says of the 200 million in Revelation 9 in verse 19, for their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents, and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And um, serpents and scorpions are almost synonymous. Um, Jesus joins the two together in Luke chapter 10, verse 19. I give you power to, to tread on serpents and scorpions. So they're, they're really interchangeable, representing, when Christ was speaking, representing the false gospels and and those that bring them. But when we read of the locusts that are loosed, they are the elect. They're the ones that God is using to to bring about destruction. And so too in Revelation 9, it says in verse 14, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, loose the four angels or messengers which are bound in the great river Euphrates, and the four messengers were loosed. 
Now, this is referring to the great multitude that were bound in their spiritual prison of sin and held captive in that sense in the world, as Euphrates is a synonym for Babylon. And on May 21, all were loosed. But at the same time, in order to bring the judgment that that the following verses describe, where these 200 million are identified with fire and brimstone coming out of their mouth, it has to be that they are representing, if not the actual number, of all those saved throughout the history of the world. And that's because on Judgment Day, uh, Revelation 20 tells us the book of life is open. It, It says in Revelation 20, verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, this is giving us a good insight into what took place when God shut the door to heaven. He saved everyone whose name had been written in the Lamb's book of life. And, And so judgment day began, and now it's as if, The books are open and the book of life. And so God now is um, pouring out his wrath, the cup of his wrath, and giving it to drink to everyone whose name is not found in the book of life. And, And that requires that all have been saved, that everyone of the elect had been reached, and God had done a work of salvation in them. And that's what the 200 million are representing, that sum total of the whole company of the elect, and that's why out of their mouth is proceeding fire and brimstone. The fact that God saved them all means that there's no more to save, there is no more possibility for anyone to become saved, this is the judgment of God. But this are, is the wrath they, of God. They are, they are presently um, issuing fire and smoke and brimstone and a third part of men are being killed by yes. na- uh, at now at this, at this time because it's judgment day. Mm-hmm. That's what is confusing to me. And plus, two, the shapes of the locusts were in verse 7 of uh, Revelation 9, that the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. Uh, yes. You know, that's what's so, so confusing. I thought that uh, these 200,000 were those, uh, 200,000,000, excuse me, are those who are alive at this point during Judgment Day. Uh, well, those, uh, well, let, let, let's um, let's uh, look at the two things that you're curious about. The third part, by these three, was the third part of men killed, it says in Revelation 9.18. Right. By the fire, by the smoke, and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. Now, the third part identifies with the church. If you just read Revelation 8, when the judgments are are falling... It's on the third part, the third part, because uh-huh. judgment began at the house of God. And then the transition we read about in Revelation eight thirteen: woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. The first four are on the church. Then the transition continues in chapter 9 of the three woes are on the inhabitants of the earth, the world. And, And so the third part identifies with those in the churches. And what happened immediately on May 21? Well, tragically, all those that refused to hearken, they refused to listen to God, that they had to get out of the church. Because in the church, throughout the entire duration of the Great Tribulation, 
there was no possibility of salvation. So they could not have possibly been saved prior to May 21 if they were in the church. And then Judgment Day comes, and it's the expansion. Now it's not just the third part or, or about two billion. Now the judgment includes all the earth. But the door to heaven shut on May 21. So if they were in a, um, a spiritual situation, and they were, where they could not possibly have been saved in the church, now they, they enter into a worse situation because they cannot possibly be saved in the world, which means there's no more possibility for salvation, which tells us that they were killed right away. They were killed immediately when the door to heaven shut. They, they had no hope. Well, isn't it true of those outside of the churches? Yes, but the difference is that God broadcast the gospel to all the world to about 5 billion people outside of the churches, and the great multitude was located there. And they heard the gospel in one way or another, in some form or some fashion, they heard it. God saved them, and it could be anybody. And so judgment day comes, the door shuts, but we don't know about them. It could be um, that this one or that one outside of the church did become saved. And in probability, they didn't because the vast majority of people did not. But we don't know. So in a sense, they are not killed in the way that those in the churches were killed, the third part. And and that that's how we understand. Now, the, the 200 million are riding on horses because of what we read in Revelation 19, it says of the Lord Jesus um, that, that he comes with the saints. We read in many places in the Bible, and it That's says in Revelation nineteen fourteen, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. There is Christ and his army on horseback, and this relates to Revelation 9, the 200 million horsemen. And it also relates to Revelation 14. Isn't it interesting... Um, at the end of Revelation 14, we read also about the winepress of God. And well, I'll just read verse 19 and 20. And the angel thrust it in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse bridles. By the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs, you know, uh, I've always wondered. I'm sure others have too. Why does God mention that? That that the wine press was trodden and blood came out unto the horse bridles because, like we read in Revelation 19, Christ, the rider on the white horse, is the one who treads or trods the wine press, and he has his horsemen with him the elect are with him remember we're we're told that ye will judge the world uh, in 1 Corinthians 6 with God and and so there are the believers on horseback and as Christ is treading out the winepress of his wrath the blood flows unto the horse bridles or right up until the the true believers who are witnessing, and in a sense, they are his weapon, uh, we are his battle axe, 
that is bringing this judgment to pass because of not anything we're doing. We're still called upon to love our fellow man and to have great concern for them and to pray for them. And and we don't hurt anyone in any way, but God is using us as a weapon as he has acted upon us in saving all of us. And that fact is the main instrument of his cruelty to the rest of the world as he, um, as he is destroying them in this day of judgment. But thank you for your questions and bringing up those verses. And let's thank go you. to the next person. Welcome to our Friday night question and answer. Yes, Anj1021 asks, I have a cousin who is getting married next month, and I am invited to her wedding. She is Catholic, and her fiancé is Jewish. My cousin has never been married before, and I don't believe her fiancé has been either. I know the Bible tells us not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Is being a guest in attendance at her wedding a violation of God's law? Well... You know, we we still have the whole question of entering churches, and personally, I prefer not to. Um, I, I, I understand that this is just a ceremony, but uh, I would never give anyone um, any sort of biblical counsel encouraging them to go into a church. You know, there's ways around these things, and and we can participate in other parts of the marriage. We can send a nice gift, give a nice card. We can go to the um, party afterwards and and so on. Um, But that's not your question. I think your question is regarding their possibly being unequally yoked. And well, you say one's a Catholic and one's Jewish. Well, we we have to keep in mind, I, I don't know if that means this person in identifying as Catholic, is going to church. But the church has been abandoned by God. The nation of Israel has been abandoned by God. So in that sense, they're on equal footing. Neither are the people of God. Now, a a true believer, he needs to find another true believer. And, uh, for instance, I would say, it's being unequally yoked if a true believer marries anyone in a church because God has called us to come out of the churches. And how can there be any sort of harmony in the marriage if, if one believer believes, well, I have to stay home, and the wife thinks, oh, no, we have to go to Protestant or Catholic church or any church. There would be no harmony at all. There would be discord. And same thing with the children. What are you going to do with the children if you marry someone in the church? Well, they're going to want a, the child to be baptized and, and to be a part of the church. Now, what have you done to your child if you enter into that kind of situation? So the true believer, uh, this time more than ever, has to be extremely careful in who he or she marries. But thank you for that question. And I'd like to thank everyone for sharing your questions and comments this evening. We have come to the end of our time. And Lord willing, we'll meet together this Sunday afternoon with our online fellowship. And we'll also have another time of question and answer uh, at that point. But for now, I'm going to say good night. And may the Lord's perfect will be done.